So I'm really excited to be here today. I was an undergraduate and a master's student here, and I see some faces that were part of that educational journey um, in the room. And uh, a lot of the kinds of questions that I look at in my research might seem like they're, they're really in conversation with anthropology and feminism, but also in conversation with my experiences in computer science. And so I'm thrilled to be able to come talk to you about this project work today and try to draw a loop between those modes of thinking and analyzing the world that often are not connected when we go to CHI or we go to an STS conference. So today I'm going to be focusing on how to, different ways of centering the human in human computation. Um, I'll be talking pretty much about Mechanical Turk as the central example because that's the work that I've been doing and that's the example that I know best. But I'm going to argue that Mechanical Turk is a way of organizing workers and programmers and digital data production that also tells us some things about high-tech production cultures more generally that we can watch out for as very elite and privileged participants in those cultures. Um, and I'll talk about Turkopticon as one intervention in, in, uh, into that kind of culture. Um, and actually, I'm getting into my overview now. So, and after talking about Turkopticon and some lessons that I learned working on Turkopticon, point out to other ecologies of worker mobilization that are happening both in this department and in the worlds of workers. So uh, to start, for any of you who don't know what, what Amazon Mechanical Turk is, I'll just do a very quick overview. So the basics of Amazon Mechanical Turk is that it's a, a payment processing platform and an online digital, digital labor market that Amazon has set up. So if you're an engineer and there's a whole bunch of images that you have of things people are uploading. Say you're going to make the cute cat site. And you need to know, are these images actually images of cute cats? Or are they not cute cats? Or are they chairs? Or are they some kind of malicious data? Uh, you need a way to sort through that mass of data that has come to characterize Web 2.0 systems. But these are th the kinds of cultural data processing tasks that artificial intelligence tends to be bad at. And for me, to understand why Terry Winograd's understanding computers and cognition is still a fantastic resource. Um, but the short version of the argument is that computers don't, are not embodied in the world culturally and socially the way people are. And so how could you expect a computer to keep up with what a cute cat is, unless you train its artificial intelligence algorithm and then keep retraining it to keep up with that? So for this kind of pro data processing problem, um, for example, Amazon built Mechanical Turk as a way of saying, well, if AI algorithms have a really hard time doing these kinds of classifications, uh, we can bring people into the loop because people are really good at making those kinds of classifications. Sometimes p these people actually do the data processing in real time. I believe LinkedIn has people do optical data recognition of their business cards and then uh, and that's done by Mechanical Turk workers. And then sometimes these workers actually create training sets in semi, you know, uh, fairly rapidly to then train machine learning algorithms that can do larger scale classification. But then the workers can be used to retrain and update those data uh, on those uh, algorithms. So how is this different from any kind of like data processing outsourcing operation. I mean, we've had a couple of decades of sending large amounts of office documents to places with lower labor costs with, uh, and a lot of English skills, like India, uh, where people will go and digitize what people have written in hand on forms and upload into a system. Well, the one big difference that I'm going to focus on today is that Amazon Mechanical Turk actually organizes all these workers over here so that they're accessible through, an, through APIs, through algorithms, and through acts of coding. So instead of going out and finding a business processing outsourcing center, or signing a contract, having that, that center having to have a manager, this in some sense, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk in some sense allows programmers to become managers through familiar acts of coding. So when Mechanical Turk, Mechanical Turk came out, I think in 2006, and in 2000, and I think eight, I was in my first, second year of grad school, and the debate, it seemed to me like this was a way of creating a lot of jobs with no minimum wage, and I was a little bit puzzled that the tech culture that I'd come from that was so utopian in aspirations for creating a better world, I worked at Google, um, you know, had also produced the system that produced so many jobs, but they seemed to be so low paying. And at the time, there was sort of a debate of, you know, does AMT empower workers? or does AMT exploit workers? So on the empowerment side, 
You had people saying, well, you know, people are doing this work for fun. Clay Shirky's cognitive surplus had, was, I think, about to come out. Um, they're just killing time and getting paid instead of paying to play World of Warcraft. Or one to two dollars an hour is a good income for people in developing countries where the assumption was that a lot of these workers would be doing this work from, because why would an American do work for a dollar or two an hour? Um, as it turns out, there are mostly Americans working in these systems, but we'll get to that. Um, also, the, in some ways, Mechanical Turk allows workers to work from home, to work from their pajamas. They don't have to pay for gas to get to work. And they can, to some extent, choose their employers. So there's a se sense of freedom that was seen as part of the platform. Um, and this was the dominant story in the public and media view. So on the flip side, you have the reading mostly coming from communication scholars, academics, <laughs> academic Marxists, <laughs> that this is completely exploitative. Um, one dollar an hour is nothing in comparison to the potential profits that are being made. Um, Amazon Mechanical Turk is taking jobs that maybe would have offered benefits or some stability and making them even more precarious. We have to choose a new employer every couple of days. Um, and this was pretty uh, limited to academia and very cynical corners of it. Uh, but Coming into it as graduate students, my colleague Six Silberman and I are the people who, we've been really on this journey together for the last six years working on this. Um, it seemed exploitative to us, but we were not workers working with this system. So it still seemed like an open question as to what the experiences uh, workers were having in the system were and whether they experienced them as exploitative. So, I wasn't in a social science class, I was in an art class. <laughs> and so I put out a, a non-rigorous, non-social scientific, open-ended survey asking workers, if you could have a Turker's Bill of Rights, what would you want to be in that Bill of Rights? So I got 67 responses. Um, 30, 35 of the responses complained, were workers complaining about unfair or arbitrary rejections. So one of the things that Amazon did was to attract employers to the system, because it's a really new technology, was give employers a lot of discretion about whether the employers had to pay or not. So if employers didn't like the kind of data work they were receiving, they could say this is low quality or this is spam, and no questions asked, they could refuse payment. But it seemed like a number of workers felt that they were um, getting caught in a trap of overzealous employers rejecting their work. And they didn't, and there's no way in the system for arbitration to happen. Um, employers don't have to respond to workers when they complain. Um, some workers said that they weren't getting paid quickly enough, that employers would take 30 days to pay them for a task that only took three minutes. And for ones that were working to make ends meet um, or to make money last minute to sort of make final rent, this payment speed was a real problem. Um, and that Amazon and employers seemed generally unresponsive to workers' concerns because there were way more workers, uh, it seemed, than employers. So if this worker went away, then another worker would come to fill the spot. And a much smaller number, but some, complained that there's no minimum wage. But the upshot from this experiment was actually that a lot of the things that we assumed would be a problem, like the lack of minimum wage, wasn't the dominant thing people were complaining about. And there were things that neither the empowerment or the exploitation side had thought of, had not thought of, that workers recognized as really salient, immediate problems. Uh, so, it was, and it was, so as one worker put it, uh, the way Amazon had organized the interface, there was a pervasive sense of unfairness about, uh, what, about um, who made the decisions in the worker-employer relationship. So this worker describes uh, his feelings this way. I don't care about the penny I didn't earn for not knowing the difference between an apple and a giraffe. But I'm angry that Mechanical Turk will take a requester's money, but not manage, oversee, or mediate the problems and injustices on their site. So we're seeing here the, an example of a worker talking about a feeling that within this workplace, they generally don't have power and it's kind of by the policy and the interface designs, even if the actual monetary outcomes of that imbalance might be small. It's, it still bothered them as a matter of fairness. So when, we try, so when Six and I tried to take these concerns seriously, we started to see that simply enabling employers to respond to workers wouldn't necessarily make sense because the part of the point of Mechanical Turk is that an employer, a programmer, can hire 60,000 people to do a bunch of data work in a couple of days, or an academic can hire a bunch of experimental subjects and do that um, 
and get their data work done or their experimental subjects run really quickly. So mediation and arbitration is fundamentally unscalable. The promise of Mechanical Turk is large-scale data labor for small operators and nimble actors. So as one requester put it, you can't spend time exchanging mail. The time you spent looking at the email costs more than what you paid them. This has to function on autopilot or as an algorithmic system and integrated with your business processes. So this led us to a broader insight that really what is powerful about Amazon Mechanical Turk, and I hinted at this in the beginning, is that M Mechanical Turk makes workers, people, into a scalable computational infrastructure. And what happens when you, and this has been part of the dream from the beginning. So when Jeff Bezos launched Mechanical Turk uh, at MIT, he gave a talk where he had a little pseudocode snippet where this is a pseudocode showing how a Mechanical Turk worker could be brought into an algorithmic loop to do image processing. So this is the call where, you know, call Mechanical Turk, is there a human in the picture, photo, zero two. And, so a programmer can code this up, walk away, and get 60,000 images processed. You guys are familiar with this. Um, and this is, <laughs> this is actually a picture from the MIT homepage in 2010. It was actually about Michael's work, which is one of the reasons I'm really thrilled to be working with Michael, because he's very um, engaged and interested in having a critical dialogue and a productive cre um, interventionist dialogue about this. But So MIT advertised Michael's amazing work with crowds, uh, by putting a whole bunch of people on a microchip. So this thing that gets manufactured in large numbers by Dell that we buy, that we put in our houses, and has been promised to empower us with uh, the powers of computing and interactive technologies, now you can put workers inside and they can power, they can power that same uh, computational platform. So one of the things that was interesting to me was that simply putting people in a chip and putting it on a website doesn't make that narrative make sense to a broad number of people. But we kept seeing this narrative show up in different places on the MIT homepage and Jeff Bezos launch dialogue. When um, Mechanical Turk came out, people said, oh, it's like the human API. It's humans as a service. So continually there's this reimagining of all the power of a, a coder at a machine building amazing things, but now you can get people to power that same ma computational magic that we build in departments like computer science and information science as well. What was interesting to me about yeah. the first image was that it was people of multiple colors, but not of multiple genders. <laughs> 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 That's just, yeah, I never really understood why. So the, the artist, are they, Christine, mm -hmm. are they I don't gendered? know why she chose to do that. Sorry? Are they gendered? They look gendered. I, well, I, so that's, it's, the me, it's the male bathroom symbol, right? I mean, this is, yeah, it's the male bathroom symbol, and it's a long <laughs> history of basically saying people in social theory, in policy, um, in Western culture, where people tends to take on the character, we imagine the, those people having the characteristic of males. So, like, these are people that are always on in the processor, uh, and they're not, having to run out to give milk to the child that they just bore and they're at home taking care of, for example. So yeah, I mean, the fact that they're not gendered actually is interesting because it sort of assumes that everyone can be the same in the processor because they're just producing data. As far as you care, they are the same as long as they produce data. Um, so, and this is just another example of a lab at Berkeley that is algorithms, machines, and people. And they're also doing a lot of data processing using this kind of human labor. So this example actually brings me to some of the political economic forces that also make micro labor really, really attractive is that as Web 2.0 companies like Facebook have become huge and people are putting more and more of their social and cultural lives online, there's a lot of data to moderate. There's a lot of, is this porn, or is this a policy violation, or is this web page something we want a, uh, you know, some uh, web user to go to after clicking on an ad that is really hard for AI to do. And, as, and servers are expensive to run. So you need really accessible large amounts of data labor to actually process that kind of cultural data. So one of the points that I've been building up to is that Amazon Mechanical Turk isn't just a way of getting lots of data processed. It isn't just a way of making people compensate for where AI can't quite reach yet, but it will soon. But actually, Mechanical Turk is about making innovators. It's a platform that organizes 
workers in an easily accessible way so that people working on a lean startup, so grad students or faculty doing research experiments who need a lot of data fast, um, people who want to make ma amazing interactive technologies can work on soft, can keep working on the software stack and use those workers as media. So if you think of media, media is a platform that takes your inscriptions, right? You have paint, you have canvases, you have pencils and paper. Pencils and paper are not known for fighting back, for being recalcitrant, for not taking your orders. They're meant as strata that promote human expression. So Mechanical Turk takes that idea of an expressive artist and says, hey, you can do that and do it on a factory of 60,000 people producing data. And <clears throat> This also lets employers who don't know how to be managers, who don't know how to write outsourcing contracts, actually <clears throat> do this through acts of coding that they've already learned. And it also, one of the things we found in the, with the um, employers that we talked to is that it lets people who see themselves as part of the creative classes, you know, designers, journalists, redistribute the tasks that they consider to be repetitive or rote or low value, put those out into the Mechanical Turk platform so that someone else can do it and that these more elite creative class workers can focus on more valuable tasks. At the end of the day, if you know, you're a journalist and you get all your interviews transcribed by a Mechanical Turk worker, your work as a journalist is not uh, devalued, you actually publish more articles that way and you get more credit for, in some sense, the things that really matter. Because the Mechanical Turk transcription work that you got done, it does matter to your project, but getting it done faster and cheaper only helps you in the way we measure status in these creative class professions. So this kind of, <clears throat> the other thing that interface layer that uh, mediates between employers and workers does is also mediate doubt. So, in high-tech cultures, I mean, we have a long tradition of computer professionals for social responsibility, for places like Google really caring about information becoming accessible because they believe information helps people. Amazon Mechanical Turk make, puts the workers so far away that you, it's really hard to figure out what conditions workers are working under, even if you do care. So people can think things like, well, people are mostly doing it for fun, and you can't coerce someone through a screen. I'm arguing that this mediated doubt is actually something that's very powerful in making Mechanical Turk take off among really well-meaning programmers and engineers. So um, putting those two things together, um, the argument here is that Mechanical Turk makes labor invisible in a way that sustains the myths of peer production in high tech. So for me, this came, uh, I, gave, I was really struck by a story a designer told me that I met in India. Um, he was talking about making a system that process, processes uh, web, uh, webcam images of traffic in different intersections in an in African city. And he said, well, we have a bunch of low paid workers in the design studio that are processing these images and making them into data so that we can have this mobile app that uh, lets commuters figure out which streets to avoid. But it's kind of awkward having such different kinds of workers in the same studio because so much of how we talk about creating spaces of innovation is about creating spaces of flow, of comfort, of play, of quick and easy interdisciplinary sharing. So having lower status data processing workers in that space was a problem for him and he said, oh, maybe Mechanical Turk can help me solve that problem. So, I'm emphasizing this because I think this is one way that what Mechanical Turk represents is actually a feature of innovation culture more broadly in some of the ways that, say, janitors don't get paid very much because they get hired through many levels of subcontractors, but that kind of wage structure is hidden from workers who are well-meaning but work in these large tech companies. Um, okay, so. This is, how, this is kind of how far we got with our analysis, but the question was how to proceed. Um, workers on Mechanical Turk had a really different range of problems. Some of them wanted unions, some of them said, no unions, no way, I want to be a freelancer. And so we tried to identify places where workers did agree, that they had some kind of common issue. Yeah, Gilbert. Don't pay attention if this is too much of a digression, but when you mentioned uh, in particular, that uh, this mediated doubt. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if that there's something particularly different about that from just alienation of workers. Um, alienation of workers in a Marxist sense of separating someone from their means from their the things that they're producing. 
Well, that as well as uh, alienation of computers <coughs> from their the managers in this case. Hmm. Um. Kind of want to. Yeah. Alien. Well, I can I write that on the whiteboard and <laughs> come back to that? Terry, is this the first time someone's used the whiteboard during a talk? Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, all those Stanford design oh. classes. Oh, yes, Curtis. Don't, don't, don't the screen. Oh no! What did I do? <laughs> 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 it's in the back. Touching the white paper. The invisible lance. You didn't learn how to clutch the connect that's on the back of the room. But... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. I think that's a really good question, but I, I'm, I'm a little worried. I just want to make sure to get through Tarkovtikon as an example and then come back to it. So, um, so in figuring out where to proceed, we didn't want to side with the empowerment or the exploitation. Um, we wanted to figure out a project that would let us meet workers where they're telling us they are. Um, at the same time as somewhat improving their conditions and, pro and provoking a debate about ethics in human computation that we felt like wasn't happening in human computer interaction, AI, and the media. So that brings me to the main uh, project that Michael is talking about, which is called Turkopticon, um, which we built to interrupt invisibility and support mutual aid among workers in Mechanical Turk. And that's the work that I've been doing with Six Silverman, as well as there's three Mechanical Turk workers who are moderators, uh, Taint Turk, Hanwan, and Midwinter, and also workers who write all the reviews that make Turk Opticon at all meaningful. So I'll tell you a little bit about what that work has been. So Turk Opticon is an attempt to take uh, this uh, configuration that makes workers in inv invisible and reconfigure those optics. So what it does is it lets workers in Mechanical Turk review employers. Um, so we have a website. There's a database that contains the reviews. They're matched to requester IDs. And uh, there's also Firefox and Chrome tools that workers can install. So as they're browsing Mechanical Turk tasks, we insert a button next to each Mechanical Turk requester, pulling up any reviews we have for that ID. And we insert them in the page where the worker will be making the decision about who to work for. So <clears throat> what we ask for in the reviews uh, are four categories that we got from talking, from reading those Mechanical Turk bills of rights responses. It seemed like a lot of workers complained about communicativity of the employer, the generosity of the employer, I mean, wages, the fairness of the employer. You know, does the employer respond when there's been a mistake? <laughs> um, and promptness, how quickly does the employer pay? So within that, we have workers rate on each of those categories on a scale of one to five. Uh, and then we encourage workers, so this is over here on the Tricopticon website, um, we encourage workers to also write open-ended comments explaining their interpretations. Yeah, do you have a question? Okay. Um, so we ask workers to quantify, not because we think that these particular qualities are readily uh, quantifiable. It's actually really, how do you quantify generosity if you are you have different sets of workers who need vastly amounts of dif vastly different amounts of money to live but because mechanical turk workers are working in such a fast production culture they're choosing among many employers they have a lot of judgments to make they're choosing employers every day maybe even every couple of hours so Expecting them to pour through open-ended reviews just seems sort of unrealistic. So the numbers say, well, if this employer has really good numbers, then go ahead and work for them. But if it's, some, if it's anything more ambiguous, then we really wanted there to be a more interpretive archive of what makes this worker good or bad. <clears throat> and so that tool um, is in, that, in that website, this is the home page for it. So it's more than just functional. It's more than just a way of evening the information playing field. Um, it was actually meant to use design as an intervention into the politics around crowdsourcing. So drawing from Carl DeSalvo's work at Georgia Tech, um, our homepage is deliberately agonistic. So agonistic democracy is the idea that rather than working towards consensus, democracies function better when you encourage people to produce strong positions in which different points of view, different experiences, different information can come out. So this homepage is meant to provoke a response, provoke work, you know, we have a classified ad up here, help wanted, 120 an hour, risk of repetitive stress injury, no care for on the job injuries, no guaranteed minimum wage, mechanical Turk industries. And the purpose of that, it wasn't that we thought that people were going to believe us. We knew that 
people have lots of different opinions. We wanted to provoke the debate. So we were using design not only just to make something usable, but also to make something that provokes a set of discourses around it. So within that, um, we've been fairly success uh, successful in serving, uh, serving some needs of workers in the mechanical Turk workforce. Uh, we have, our usage has grown. Um, we have, 20, I guess, something like 20,000 unique visitors. Um, but I don't want to present this as an unalloyed success. Like, this is not enough to actually claim impact. Um, so on the one hand, Turkopticon enables workers to aid one another. On the other hand, there are problems. So in some sense, Turkopticon, sorry, I, I meant to say Turkopticon enables workers to aid one another. But Turkopticon also, in some sense, legitimizes Amazon Mechanical Turk. Like, what if some competitor that had better labor practices could come along and replace Mechanical Turk, and Turkopticon is actually making it harder for that competitor to break through? Um, I also learned from Mary Gray at Microsoft Research, who's doing work on crowdsourcing, that a lot of workers who are in India find Turkopticon and other American-run worker forums to be inhospitable places because a lot of workers diagnosing the low wages in Mechanical Turk will say, oh, it's because workers from these other countries will work for anything. And that's our problem. And so while that might relieve, relieve stress or be one theory, uh, Indian workers stay away. And she, Mary was saying they share information in other formats <clears throat> on the web. So, I want to, I'm, taking a, I'm making an effort to present this as ambivalent because I think a lot of times in design we talk about coming up with solutions and improving. And here it's very clear that there's an intervention and it certainly changes the conditions of reality. But it all depends on what perspective you take, whether it's for the better or for the worse. But at least it's different than what it was six years ago. So I wanted to <clears throat> conclude by pointing out to other kinds of horizons and ecologies of workers engaging in mutual aid and trying to improve conditions in, within crowd work. And I'll explain a little bit about why. Um, so one of the really important places where workers talk with one another, and it's been like this for six years at least, um, are forums like Turker Nation, Cloud Me Baby. And these are forums that are operated by workers where workers can share information with one another. They can, you know, people pray for each other when they're having bad weeks. People lend each other money. Nilufar discovered through some of her work, Nilufar Salehi here, who I'm collaborating with. Um, and workers will take really stable kinds of computational infrastructure, like PHP-based forums, put them on a server, and then use this to their own ends. And the communities that get built here, the discussions that get built here, affect the ability people have then in Tricopticon, workers have in Tricopticon to talk with one another, resolve disputes, or sometimes fights spill over from here into Tricopticon. So Tricop taking the design of Tricopticon alone doesn't explain the social dynamics of Tricopticon because Tricopticon exists as one place that people from these forums pass through. <clears throat> There's also um, emergent Turker tactics that come out of workers talking with one another in these forums and on Tricopticon. So, um, more receptive requesters or employers will come to these forums and ask workers, why isn't anyone doing my task? Or why are you guys giving me such horrible reviews and how can I fix it? So these forums make possible some of that negotiation at a larger scale than email interactions for requesters that actually want to be fair, but where email was an inadequate way of promoting that kind of problem, supporting that problem resolution. Um, Anecdotally, I've actually heard a number of workers talk about holding out for a minimum pay rate of $6 an hour, which as I understand it is coming out of just conversations in these forums and they ha have a really hard time enforcing that pay rate because you can't have a, it's hard to have a boycott when a lot of workers desperately need the money. But it's an emergent tactic and it'll be interesting to see what happens with it. Um, some workers actually use the IRB, the Institutional Ethics Review Boards that universities have to have to hold employers who are academic researchers accountable. So if a researcher runs an experiment and doesn't pay, there's a, one worker in New Zealand and one of our moderators who seems to take a thrill out of calling the IRB and using that institutional mechanism to, to call those uh, employers to account. So that was one of the favorite things I'd ever heard about IRB. <clears throat> and I mentioned that Nilufar found, well, yeah. That's actually an excellent tactic because unlike if I were to complain to, say, like, LinkedIn, mm -hmm. you know, approve, like, if they're having a problem with LinkedIn, 
the IRB will con like that's actually a, a higher power that would go talk to this individual. So that's yeah. a really adaptively intelligent strategy. Yeah. Yeah. As it's, well as the potential consequences are a lot higher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and the, I mean, so that, the reason I'm highlighting these kind of emergent worker tactics and these web-based forums is because I think that we need to value them the way that you're valuing them. Um, and they tend to not be valued. So one of the experiences that we had with Tricopticon was that journalists who wanted to say, oh, Mechanical Turk is a digital sweatshop, would then come to Tricopticon and say, oh, look, Techies caused this problem. Techies are solving this problem. Thank goodness we have smart people working on this. And workers who are reading these news articles will say, these articles cast us as dopes, <laughs> that we're just you know, being engineered through these different platforms, and we have saviors coming in to tell us what we need to help ourselves. Um, so that, to me, that was a real lesson, that when we do these design interventions to improve people's lives, no matter how much on the ground work is necessary to actually make that design intervention sustain and have life, we tend to focus on the software authors or the authors of the design interventions to credit them as the heroes or the entrepreneurs that instigated this change. Not only is that bad social analysis in this case, it's also really bad for politics because it creates a, it created a lot of, um, it basically insulted it basically insulted the very workers that it sought to describe and the possibility of moving forward in a more collaborative way. So um, that's why I'm taking a, uh, making an effort here to focus on some of these things that don't look like writing new algorithms or making new mechanisms um, or making something that would be recognizable as inventive intellectual property, but has been sustained and innovative. So to conclude, so one of the, the third project, and this is where I'll conclude, is work that uh, Nilufar is leading and Michael and I are supporting, which is uh, actually, I'll just skip ahead, um, it's called CrowdFlash. And so in brief, CrowdFlash builds on the insight that a worker had during some interviews I did at Irvine, where he said, this guy, this worker had done labor organizing, um, this guy Nick, he lives in Ithaca. And he, uh, the interviewer was an undergrad I was working with, Andreas, asked him, you know, have you thought about trying to organize people online? And he said, well, I've thought about it, but the community is so, like, loose that I don't even know where I'd really begin with that. I could go to all the forums and they would say, that's a great idea. We should do that. And then, you know, where's it going to go from there? And we did see examples of workers saying, hey, let's do a petition or let's do some public action in forums where some people said, yes, this is a great idea. And then it just sort of petered out. So uh, Nilufa's work is geared towards uh, giving workers a way of finding common issues, developing action plans, and then giving them the kind of social media, social computing support to actually act on that and motivate people to kind of participate all along the way. And so hopefully she'll get to give a talk about this at some point. <laughs> so um, in conclusion, uh, what I've argued here is that Making humans into computing infrastructure, it expands the agency that we have as programmers with the skills that we get while sustaining the myth of peer production, but it does it by sort of externalizing the labor that's actually necessary to making digital technologies possible. Um, Tricopticon was one attempt to interrupt that invisibility and uh, is a platform for mutual aid, but it's definitely not enough. We, so we want to take that kind of mutual aid in that community that we've been part of producing along with other worker-run forums and continue participating in this ecology of, of giving workers the ability to hold employers and hold Amazon more accountable to pressure for changes that would make their work conditions better. So with that, maybe I'll get questions or address Gilbert's question. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> So should I try to start with your question? Um, I'm really not trying to, I'm not a question avoider. Um, so your question was, can, was about whether a uh, mechanical Turk produces alienation between workers and their managers? Well, I guess you, you mentioned sort of uh, <coughs> this mediated doubt as something yeah. that sounded somewhat new. And I was <laughs> wondering what, what exactly is new there compared to just alienation from for instance, outsourcing already, or? Oh, I see. I think for me, mediated doubt is, uh, so the outs so there's lots of ways that people um, either have gaps in empathy or understanding, 
or that um, the structures of needing to produce profitable businesses or to produce more academic papers also make it possible for people to kind of self-interestedly ignore dimensions of the kinds of social relations they need to push on other people to get that work done, right? So that's a very old story. I think for me, mediated doubt is just the extra layer of, OK, wait, but if you have this community that is very publicly committed to um, producing progress through the work that they're doing. Like a McKinsey consultant <laughs> historically doesn't say, oh, I'm going to make the world a better place by figuring out better ways of doing mergers and acquisitions and gaining efficiencies, <laughs> or you know, private equity, or outsourcing companies. But here we have an industry where people actually are invested in that kind of progress through the work that they do, and yet still. Um, uh, this interface layer, making humans sit behind an API, sort of helps mitigate some of the tensions of the vast inequality that actually is being produced here. So I think that's the only incremental bit that's different. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I mean, the principal component of this seems to be that Amazon created a broken system, and look what ev how everything breaks after that, right? So if they got for the third parties. Well, I, I mean, so things like forums, right, where mm -hmm. you're essentially organizing for public action against a private employer. Mm -hmm. right? And to me, uh, the question then is, if you need to develop a candidate joke again, or if you need to develop something else, mm -hmm. uh, how would, what would we change in order to do it better? Right? And I ask this because when we started doing the peer assessment work mm -hmm. in large classes, uh, when I hear it's course class, anyone would send us email and say, hey, my grade was unfair. Mm -hmm. uh, look at it, and we would look into it. Mm -hmm. And you said you couldn't we would, we would look into okay. it, and we would give them a grade if uh, it was unfair. Mm -hmm. And I, I met someone else from a different class some weeks ago, and they're like, we just can't deal with the retail requests. So to be fair to everybody, we don't deal with any of them. Mm -hmm. right? And right. it, it, it seems like once you create the system, <laughs> that there's a lot of potential for things to go wrong. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering if you have any ideas how to design things into the system so they don't. That's a really good question. Um, I, one of the things that I've been startled by, the more I think about this, um, and the more MOOCs become something that, you know, are part of public consciousness. And you know, I'm teaching in a University of California institution now, which has kind of like been doing learning at scale <laughs> for a while, is how similar some of the problems actually are. Um, I mean, I think at the end of the day, one of the lessons for me is that you can't actually, you can design some things into the system, and that's why I'm really glad to be working with, say, Michael and Nilufar. And Six has been thinking about how would you design a system that makes, um, that changes the economic incentives that requesters have for the ways that they behave. But also, uh, within that, you're also within, say, with Mechanical Turk in a social structure where you know, companies need to make profits or promise profits in order to get investments. And so it still remains profitable to outsource work that's less valued in a market economy um, to people who can do it. and. Uh, that you know, so and to own the the means of that production. So, like economic, at some level, economic structure is also a question here, which is different than the MOOC case in a sense. Well, that's true as well. But I, I think people are not complaining about the economic incentives; they're complaining about fairness, more or less. <laughs> well, they're complaining about the economics of it too. A lot of the more senior workers will not work for a lot of the new employers or the notoriously low-paying employers, like. LinkedIn is notorious for paying very little to its workers. And the only reason workers go, at least the kind of my ethnographic sense is that the only reason workers will do LinkedIn tasks is if their approval rating goes down because they've had a huge rejection and they have to get it back up so they can get access to the good jobs again, or that they're new and they don't have access to the good jobs. So the wages, the wages really are an issue, but that was more um, in 2006 when I was writing, um, when I was doing the Bill of Rights, the fairness was sort of the issue that cut across, and the wages were a little bit more like depending on where you're living, um, were, were, were more or less of an issue. But I think to your question about how would you design it differently, um, I don't think, I don't know that you can have human computation as, um, as a cheap platform wi without 
still having these problems. Because if you want to have an API that is served by humans and you want it to be cheap, I mean, how, you know, people are doing this. Also, people are doing this because they need the money. In many cases, we don't have updated data, but in 2010, it was 20% of people needed it to sometimes or always make ends meet, and that was before the economic crisis. And now most of the workers who are doing this are in the United States because international workers are considered to be too spammy, and so they're only given permission to do this work on very small, uh, on a very narrow basis. So. Yeah, like, is it cheap, fast, or ethical? <laughs> you know, you can only pick two, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't catch your name, but you had your hand up before, too, so. Uh, like, what is the breakdown of, um, like, the bad request? Because, like, you can imagine, there's, of course, like, the typical example of, like, something like LinkedIn, a large corporation trying to optimize the profits. But there's also the other one where, like, a person isn't actually intending to be a bad requester. Mm -hmm. They're just, like, Kind of careless, like they underestimate the amount of time that it requires to take a task, or the like, new mm -hmm. app mechanical trip, and all of that. Like, um, do they like constitute a significant portion of these like people that Tricopticon is like like essentially screwing over, or like is it? Um, I, I would say that they're a majority. So, okay, several years ago, I was at CrowdConf, and I heard from a product manager at Mechanical Turk that Tricopticon had made it so that there's a best practice among requesters that, so that when they're new, they should just approve a lot <laughs> so that they build up a reputation. And then if they are going to screw up, then screw up in a more timid way. So you could say that's screwing them over. or You could say that that's just making them extremely cautious. And what still remains a fairly low cost. Um, there are some, uh, Taint Turk has a blog. Uh, I think I skipped that slide where he, um, it's a, Tips for requesters on mechanicalturk.blogspot.com. So he actually publishes best practices for requesters. So there are efforts to educate requesters within this as well. But I don't, um, I think the fact is if you're in an incentive structure, whether you're a graduate student or a faculty member or a high tech worker where producing more and scaling up is the thing that's valued, the thing that's invested in, the thing that's rewarded, then Relying on goodwill uh, is, uh, it would be an open question whether a goodwill makes a significant dent in the wages and work conditions here. And if somebody can do that research project and show that that is the case, they would make a whole bunch of political economists, uh, they would make a breakthrough in inter polit political economy. <laughs> and I would love to see that. But all the incentives are pointing the other way. And I, so I'm coming at this as a designer and an ethnographer. So I'm cluing in more to um, what can I do not as a big corporation. Like I can't design the whole platform because I don't have a way to maintain it. Even maintaining Tricopticon is really tough. And um, there's a, there's really hard to actually sample all the workers to get a sense of what the wages you know, are, how their relationships with different workers are in a rigorous way. Mary Gray has found a way by collaborating with requesters. Um, it, but it's something where you need like very high access to employers who employ at large scale. So there's a lot of methodological limitations that prevent me from taking the kind of overview of the system. And so Tricopticon is very much a project that comes in kind of from the side and tries to make, change how a real world system works without being in it. <laughs> there you go. So I'm curious to know more about Amazon's reaction to all of this work. If you've had any, oh, yeah. Yeah. any, any, any discussions with them, um, we did meet uh, Sharon Chiarella, who's a director of Amazon, at a crowd uh, at a crowd meetup in San Francisco in like 2009. Luke Bewald, CEO of Crowdflower, actually would put on those meetups, and he invited us to come speak there. And he was actually an early supporter of Tricopticon. Uh, he when we first started Tricopticon, we wanted there to be reviews out of the box when a worker installs it. So it would be helpful so that they would then start contributing. Uh, and Luke helped, and Luke and Crowdflower helped gather the initial batch of reviews that went into the system. So I want to credit him with that first. Um, but Amazon uh, doesn't seem to, they basically don't mention us. Um, they, I believe that they own Tricopticon.com and it points to a web page that has random ads on it. <laughs> and um, so they're, who knows? <laughs> who knows how they feel? And that's, 
yeah, that's from what I've heard from people who used to work on that team at Amazon, this is a kind of small experimental project that doesn't have a lot of resources. Um, and that explains, that is what they used to explain some of the limitations in Amazon's innovations on the worker experience side. But if you also look at how Amazon runs its warehouses and its general employment policies, it's somewhat well known in high tech for um, attempting to drive great, great efficiencies out of its workforce at many different levels. So, <sighs> who knows? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, Michael. So oh. Oh, and I'll call him next. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I think this is <coughs> important and hard is that I, in a sense, view Mechanical Turk as an early diviner of what, what may come, in the sense of, okay, Mechanical Turk is low cost, uh, anyone can do <coughs> things, but looking forward, you see, in a sense, the, the, the same effect happening at for professionals. Mm -hmm. You look at systems like Top Coder, you look at systems <coughs> like, o, like Elance, Odesk, mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing a world where in the utopian view you end up, uh, <coughs> I can work on whatever I want, I can, I have control over my own career, I can become the ultimate freelancer, mm -hmm. and in the dystopian view ends up saying I end up exploited by mediated by requesting through a mediated channel. Mm -hmm. um, and given that I feel I feel like we're we're facing that down the tunnel in like some number of years that, that's somewhere between six months and like ten years. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering if given your experience, there are things you think we can do now to guide us more towards a utopian outcome than mm -hmm. a dystopian one. That's a really interesting way of framing the question. So I would, as you're talking about the utopian outcomes and the dystopian outcomes, like am I being exploited or am I being empowered? <clears throat> I think one of the things that, um, one of the ways that I look at this is less about, well actually it's not at all clear from the way I've given the talk, right? But to me, one of the key questions is, okay, what kinds of people are we becoming and what kinds of re labor relations are becoming conventional and what are their properties? Like what do they afford and what kinds of pressures or vulnerabilities or risks do they produce? Um, and so in terms of what we can change right now, uh, there are so many areas of research that I would do differently looking at it through this lens. Like instead of thinking about human computation as a kind of new management science that is primarily allied with um, the kind of top level administrators and how they can manage workforces more efficiently, I would ask of what are forms of Cooperative, or, cooperative organization, like Gilbert actually brought this up in an email conversation we had a, a year ago. You know, what would it look like to actually organize a micro labor sort of cooperative and what kind of software would need it, be needed to allow for governance and for the distribution of payments? Like if I, or okay, if I am a requester and I want a profit share on something that I make on Mechanical Turk, I have no idea how to do that. Do I, I, I think I would have to have all the requester IDs and then I would go and take the money that I make off of this item and then would have to distribute bonuses to those workers if they even have the same accounts that they had before. But you know, these things are hard and these are not the things that we're building to make it easy to organize things in, in a just way kind of out of the co computational box. So like that's an example of a kind of platform that I feel like shifting a focus um, to a just kind of distribution of labor would bring our attention to. Um, I think part of it is also actually a problem of the way we think about where change and value comes from. This is sort of what I was referencing in the way that journalists kept coming to Tricopticon and saying, you guys are really saving the workers with your technology. Someone had the headline, Unions 2.0. Um, but our Union 2.0 wouldn't work if there wasn't all these moderators, if the workers weren't actually writing reviews for the thing, if there weren't these other forums where workers were giving each other the other kinds of support they needed um, to teach each other how to be workers and this to tell each other about Jerkopticon, that kind of thing. Um, so, and I think that's built into the way we value intellectual property and patents, because patents say if you planned it and you kind of implement it, then now you have some kind of property ownership because merely implementing it is not a big deal. Um, I think that's built into some of the ways we talk about entrepreneurship and really focusing on the personal qualities of the entrepreneur and their chutzpah to implement, but we don't 
pay very much attention at all to the long-term sustainability of those enterprises or the way value gets distributed within those enterprises. Um, so that's, that's where I'd point for like larger scale kind of research agenda questions too, like how we even frame innovation. <sighs> Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, so uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk is a very, what did you say, commoditized system of allocating labor. Mm -hmm. uh, and compared to say ODES or something that's more specialized, um, do you see that uh, like the ODES worker has more leverage and therefore is less likely to organize? <coughs> or, uh, um, to be honest, I have, I have no experience with ODESK. Um, but as I understand it, ODESK workers are more skilled and so they're in a more limited supply and they tend to work on longer term projects that really benefit from having a bit of a, a kind of collaborative relationship with the employer. And Mechanical Turk is kind of the opposite of that in which a good, well-designed Mechanical Turk task is a task that can be done by whoever might land on your task. So it's a broad, it's, it's a skill that's in broad distribution and um, you don't know if the worker's gonna be good and so you need ways to quality check and you kind of treat workers like a security threat in addition to a source of value. So it, it, because of the sort of the level of skill Amazon Mechanical Turk tries to make widely distributable, um, my guess from talking to people who studied Odesk is that the social dynamics look really different. But yeah, it's a good question. I'm sorry I don't have the answer. But yeah. Sort of similar, but uh, expanding the scope slightly, it seems that there's a lot of services now which we might not even call crowd work, mm -hmm. but you know, um, Uber and Lyft mm -hmm. are two. Um, I know of other people who've done copywriting. Mm -hmm. um, TaskRabbit, Task mm -hmm. of course. Um, I have a friend who's um, crowdsourcing, in a sense, uh, economic um, indicators by having people in Shenzhen take pictures of produce to figure out what prices no. are. <laughs> um, this is like the cost of a week's worth of food around the world, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah exactly, because a lot of those governments don't uh, produce very reliable econometrics and certainly not so granular or mm -hmm. rapid. Um, but it, it seems like there's a lot of movement out of sort of completely generic uh, labor markets mm -hmm. and into more specialized mm -hmm. ones. And I was wondering if you've looked at any of that at all or have any thoughts about how that changes uh, the story some from... Mechanical Turk story. I think that the Mechanical Turk story that I've told is most, so I think of it as a kind of sensitizing lens, right? I don't want to speak for all crowdsourcing because what's a crowdsourcing enterprise? It's sort of that anything that involves large numbers of people that someone finds it benefits them to call crowdsourcing, maybe because it attracts venture capital or whatever. <laughs> um, but it's, I think the Mechanical Turk story I'm telling is a sensitizing lens for looking at um, organizations in tech that rely on really different valued kinds of labor, um, where some, you know, the people at the upper levels have an incentive to want to get rid of that. So like Lyft doesn't feel like that kind of labor where, oh man, you know, driving is such a low value activity. If I hire a Lyft person, I can you know, write all my books during that time, you know? Like Lyft, the Lyft story seems like it's more about um, adding a lot more supply to the transportation market um, and trying to treat that like a gift and managing the affective relations between the driver and the passenger so that everyone feels like it's kind of sharing, but it's actually, there's a donation that's expected. And so I think that opens up a whole bunch of different kinds of issues. I mean, Mechanical Turk on the affective emotional side is interesting in that People use mechanical Turk workers to do emotional, oh, what is it, like um, sentiment analysis? Like let's analyze all the tweets and find out if people are angry it's for our brand. But you don't actually care about the worker emotions, you care about the emotions in the tweets. But you need w workers who have an emotional processing kind of, uh, a kind of um, an emotional literacy for the text so they can produce that as data. So these systems are, these interfaces are sometimes about sort of cutting down the interaction to just the parts that to just the parts that matter. And I guess the, the, then the question becomes, by cutting it down to just the parts that matter, are you cutting out all the, ex all the unjust externalities? Or are you just creating a space where it's actually really flexible? Um, so that's where the political economy kind of comes into view. But um, 
Yeah. <laughs> it's a good question. It's not like I have an answer for it. So I was just trying to think it through with you. Yeah, Chimai. So uh, I'm, I'm starting to, uh, you know, in real time, kind of develop this hypothesis about the mechanical token. It seems to me that, uh, as you said, it, it sort of puts an API in front of the worker and removes the diversity of the work that the worker can produce. Mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. at the end of your segment <coughs> analysis task, you give positive, negative, neutral. Mm -hmm. right? That's your contribution as a human being. Right. right. And it seems to me that if you turn this around and then say, well, if we want to embrace and celebrate the diversity, and then we could create, say, a marketplace which looks somewhat like Etsy, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, as for skills rather than... <coughs> and I, I wonder if you... Uh, and the, the problem there is, how does a requester figure out <coughs> how to recruit from this pool of really diverse skills? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts on how that side of the equation could look. If we so it seems like, and the way I'm understanding your question is, um, you know, why do we have a limitation of what we imagine wanting to make possible through crowdsourcing? And can we imagine more interesting outcomes yeah. that we could have? Um, I think one of the reasons why that's hard is because sometimes, in my experience, um, you know, when I was coming out of computer science, I had very little exposure to the complexities of being a tech writer or of being a photographer. I mean, there's a lot of, or even being a cook or a child caregiver, you know? Like, you learn that code is this virtuosic thing, and um, so part of the paucity of imagination might be a paucity of sort of the disciplinary trainings that a lot of the people who are using these systems might come into it. Uh, with and then part of it, we were talking. Nilufar and Michael and I were talking about why is it that none of the crowd workers use crowdsourcing? Yeah. Like the Mechanical Turk is designed if you, for the kinds of data processing tasks the programmers that Amazon had, um, and now lots of people can use it. Um, but so the people that are doing designing these platforms are not at all the people are are people who are already kind of come through a very limited pipeline and gateway. So I'm not sure. Like, that might be part of the reason why it's hard. I don't know off the top of my head right now. Like we could, But I think one of the things that's interesting about your work, for example, with MOOCs. MOOCs are very controversial when people get scared that it means they're going to teach 150,000 students to get a stamp from a prestigious institution, and then all of the kinds of face-to-face -face learning experiences that other educational institutions are providing will be devalued because you just want to get a Stanford certificate. But a lot of your work is about making actual peer evaluation something that's viable and well supported so that actually more people can give peer students that kind of thick learning experience. So I think maybe you should tell us <laughs> how to imagine um, it, giving the crowd a sense of richness in productivity as opposed to an extraction of um, value or an broadcasting education out. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your work. Um, OK, Michael's looking kind of like, how are we doing on time? Oh, OK. Yeah. So like, the approach you've taken with like Tarkovka seems like very much optimized towards like maximizing um, like income for the, for the worker. But like a lot of workers, like the motivations, it's like diverse, right? Like some of them are like money. A lot of others are like they do it because it's like enjoyable slash uh, fun and interesting, right? Um, mm. uh, Question. <laughs> uh, like, and they don't need the money? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, <coughs> has there been any, like, kind of uh, work on, like, evaluating, like, how, like, fun and interesting the um, tasks that, like, the uh, requesters have posted are? Um, I know that people have written about needing to be concerned about what workers' motivations are. I mean, this is the paper that you wrote with Nikki Couture and John Horton and a lot of folks. Looking at motor worker motivations, how do you make more tasks fun? So I think that people are concerned with that. It's not actually clear to me that the majority of workers right now are doing it for fun. Like sort of, I'll say anecdotally slash ethnographically, because all I know is what I know from the people I work with, the moderators, the forum posts I read on Turk Our Nation. I don't know anybody who just does it for fun. <laughs> they might do it because it's more fun than driving out to the next town to get a part-time job. But um, the days when, it, if, I, so the, uh, Six Silverman, my collaborator, was doing some number crunching, and I can't retrace the logic for it now, but his sense was that maybe like very small proportion of the work 
gets done by the people who might be doing it for fun or doing it once in a while. And the bulk of the work gets done by people who are doing it kind of pretty much professionally. Um, I don't know if that jives with your intuitions. Yeah, I mean, my thought experiment <coughs> take Mechanical Turk and subtract all of the income. Do you think those people would still be there? Yeah. yeah. And I think the answer is no, which suggests to me that it's not just for fun. Yes. <laughs> That's a parsimonious way of putting it. So, while you're talking talk about the workers, um, and if people can take an example from the kind of food movement where people mm -hmm. looked at you know, fair trade and so on, in that movement it's focused on the workers, but also kind of brands and also focus on the employers. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, has there been studies of, you know, you mentioned LinkedIn, but is there kind of an institutional effort to kind of rank the workers and kind of understand, you know, how do these different employers use their cloud labor practices? Like, can I raise awareness on that level? I mean, in a way, Tripoticon is sort of a uh Yelp for employers, actually, right? Because it gathers reviews of employers. That's actually the focus of it. Um, there, I think the project Nilufar has been heading up will let work, will hopefully support workers in taking on some of those tactics. Um, so the, when you say in the food movement they're focused on brands, do you mean focusing on brands of employers as a tactic to leverage, to pressure those employers to have better practices? Ah, yeah. Organizational level, not the individual level, but sort of like, oh, all these professors come from this company, and this company has this practice. Oh, yeah. No, that's a good question. I mean, that's the kind of thing where as an academic it also gets into a little bit of a dangerous territory, right? Like, <laughs> this academic is encouraging a boycott of this exact company or whatever. So um, I think that there might be an institutional issue about where this research comes from. And no, my focus has not been to sort of lead boycotts of particular companies. Def but um, you can use the question of why hasn't that come up from a, gra from a grassroots level and ask, well, what kinds of infrastructures are missing or is that the wrong answer to the problem? And uh, you know, among other kinds of actors in this ecology, like people outside, uh, workers, other interested allies. Uh, it's a little more complicated because you're not encouraging boycotts, but you and I are both working on software that, if successful, would mediate and support boycotts. Yes. So I don't know if this is just another example of like the mediation, like removing us from responsibility, or what's exactly going on here? Yeah. Um, There's a guy named Ricardo Dominguez at UCSD who made an app that was meant to um, kind of be accompany migrants crossing the borders from Mexico to California. And the app would map out where there's water that's been placed by activists who want to support these, these migrants. Um, and it also would you know, have bits of poetry you could read to kind of give you hope along the way. I'm not even sure this app worked. It was a demo. But Ricardo Dominguez is, tenured facu is a tenured faculty at Cal IT2 and was tenured at the time. And politicians in uh, San Diego made his project into a huge issue, came after him. Um, there were investigations, trying to assess how much research money went into that because it seemed like too political, um, too political an application. And so the reality is that we're not doing this research as thinkers sitting you know, sitting in a pasture at a critical distance, but we are, we are responsible parties, we're accountable, um, and we have to make choices about which accountabilities are worth it, or which, um, kind of which risks are worth it and which risks are not, you know? So Ricardo Dominguez's story has been really instructive for me in that there, there are people who are in a more powerful position to kind of lead the charge on that sort of thing, but as somebody who's sitting in academia, I would rather do the soft, the sort of slightly soft, softer spoken thing of like, well, we're making this platform, and if y'all think that it's worthwhile, I'll take the responsibility for designing the platform and for imagining the possibility that the platform might su suggest such a thing, but um, unless I have tenure, it seems <laughs> insane to say, no, you should go, after that particular person who may have really powerful lawyers to go up against my university's really powerful lawyers. I think that's key, actually. When we talk about CHI research and the futures we design and the futures that we don't, we need to be talking about this institutional, these institutional kinds of accountabilities and risks that are shaping our research agendas, because we pretend it's all about the user. 
but it's not only. So there's actually an alt Kai paper that's about that. Um, called Anarchi by some folks from the UK. <laughs> That's my pitch. <laughs> but it just scratches the surface. So 